Hello and welcome once again dear friends and members of the Orange and Anaheim SDA churches. Pastor Mark here to uh, go through another day of Bible chapter readings for you as part of our Read Through the Bible 2021 effort. I want to greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus and we want to appeal to Jesus to inspire our hearts, convict us of what we need to be convicted of, purify us of what we need to be purified of. So as we dive in today, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for a chance to meet with our brothers and sisters. I pray that they are well in health and in relationships, dear Heavenly Father, in physical protection and also in the faith, dear Lord Jesus. Our faith is what we are here to enhance today. We want to be not mere affirmers of the book, but readers and doers and understanders of the book. And so we ask you, dear Holy Spirit, you who inspired it, to also inspire us and put down in the depths of our heart, the most secret places from which we construct our worldview, that this would be uh, a realm where your spirit is welcome and where your word is the, the key framework for which we understand all other things in life. We love you, dear Lord Jesus, and we pray a blessing on these chapters and on our reading. Please help us to not put our framework on it, but to accept its truth and to construct our framework from it. We pray all this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. So we've got four wonderful chapters for you today. We've got Exodus chapter 26. We have got Proverbs chapter 2. We've got John chapter 5. And a new book, Galatians chapter 1. So let's dive right in and see what the Lord has for us. So in Exodus, we have been seeing descriptions for things that God wants Moses to make. He wanted them to wanted Moses to be very specific because it's to follow a pattern that Moses was shown in vision. We understand that Moses was shown the heavenly sanctuary and God wanted it made uh, a likeness of it, a duplicate of it on earth. So we saw a few pieces of furniture yesterday and our first main section uh, has to do with the actual uh, building itself. It's really a tent because it was made to be mobile. So chapter 26 verse 1 here, Make the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with cherubim, that's angels, woven into them by a skilled worker. Uh, the, the sanctuary was very artful and artistic, and some of these descriptions we saw yesterday, we also saw uh, descriptions of angels in different places. And so God wants skill applied, he wants bright colors. Uh, it's the opposite of, you know, a boring or a bland place. This is to be a beautiful place with uh, precious materials used and utmost skill, bright colors. It's beautiful. Uh, so we get a lot of dimensions here with cubits. Uh, the way that you can kind of convert cubit into feet is it's kind of like one and a half. So if something says 10 cubits, that's about 15 feet. And a lot of study Bibles have a little guide in the bottom. The NIV, which I'm reading from, has um, like five different places where it's saying this many cubits means this many feet. Um, so uh, let's see, it talks about uh, loops to hold the curtains up, 50 loops, verse five, and then verse six, 50 gold clasps to fasten the curtains together so that the tabernacle is one big unit with all these different curtains. Uh, and then verse seven, there are some other curtains to make out of goat hair. Um, and again, 50 loops, verse 10, and verse 11, 50 bronze clasps to fasten the tent together as a unit. And interesting, the outer cover, verse 14, it says, Make for the tent a covering of ram skins dyed red, and over that put a covering of other durable leather. So he, God is very specific what kind of animal and what kind of dye, even though it's going to be covered up by other leather. That's interesting. Then starting in verse 15, it talks about uh, frames of acacia wood for the tabernacle itself. Uh, you're supposed to make 20 frames, verse 18, and 40 silver bases to go under them and hold them up. Um, and so it's talking about, you know, the same number on different sides here. Um, now, this is interesting. Verse 22, there's a little short part that gives us great insight. Verse 22 says, make six frames for the far end, that is the west end of the tabernacle. One thing that we are going to notice is that the tabernacle is not oriented the way that other pagan temples were oriented. All the different kinds of paganism that the Old Testament people experienced, whether it was the people living in the city states of Canaan before they went to Egypt, or the Egyptians, or you know the surrounding nations later on, all of those different forms of worship somehow had sun worship 
based in it. And I guess I can see that. People who are ignorant, you know, we have this longing in our hearts to worship, but what do we worship? And the sun is obviously the most powerful thing that uh, warms the air and, you know, lets the plants grow. And if the sun were to go out, we would be up a creek really fast. So all these other forms of paganism, other forms of worship, their temples would face the sun so that as the priests would go in in the morning, they would be facing the sun. And as they go into the temple, they're getting closer to the rising sun in the east. But the Hebrew temple was to be the opposite. It Notice it said the far end is the west end, which means they're coming in at the east end. Now think of it. If you are a priest and it's your job around sunrise time to go and open up the temple, and then you go in through the courtyard and into the holy place and into the most holy place, which will be described here today, as you're going farther in, you're going west, which means your back is to the sunrise. So this is subtle. We don't see it overtly said here, but I think the physical direction of it was a reminder to the priests every day that worship of Yahweh, the one true God, has nothing to do with sun worship. We mentioned briefly earlier in Genesis chapter 1 that Moses intentionally omitted using the words sun and moon on day 4. Rather, he said uh, greater light and lesser light. Not that there's any confusion there, but he just avoided those words because those were the names of the sun god and the moon god. So uh, just a couple of very subtle ways, but we have a strong indication that worship of the one true God, Lord of heaven and earth, Yahweh, has nothing to do with sun worship. Okay, so uh, that's why whenever you see a diagram, and we're going to be looking at some diagrams today and going forward, you'll always see it oriented what you would think would be the opposite way. Because usually we read left to right, and so yeah, it should be laid out left to right. But if given that on most maps, west is to the left, it'll be oriented this way. We'll show you when we get to it here. Let's see. Um, then it talks about uh, crossbars, verses 26 through 28. And verse 29, overlay the frames with gold and make gold rings to hold the crossbars. Overlay those crossbars with gold. Verse 30, set up the tabernacle according to the plan shown you on the mountain. God keeps reminding him, remember what you saw. It should be looking like that. Verse 31 talks about uh, another curtain here. Uh, I think this is the curtain that divides the holy place from the most holy place. Curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yawn, finely twisted linen, with cherubim, again angels, woven into it by a skilled worker. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood, um, silver bases, hang the curtain from the clasps, place the Ark of the Covenant Law behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Put the atonement cover on the ark, that's the mercy seat. In fact, here's something I forgot to mention yesterday. That mercy seat or atonement cover, that word comes up in the New Testament. It's in 1 John chapter uh, 2, I want to say verse 2. I'll put a little bar here if I'm wrong here. But it says that God made Jesus to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The actual word that is used there is the mercy seat. He made Jesus to be the mercy seat for our sins. So you notice here it's called an atonement cover. He is the atoning sacrifice and it's the same word used for Jesus. So the law is perfect but it is harsh and it's not salvific and it's not loving but Jesus is the mercy through which it's almost like the um, the the sieve, the, how do you say, the mesh through which uh, the law comes to us or we come to the law kind of thing. So. Um, let's see, put it on the Ark of the Covenant law in the most holy place, place the table outside the curtain on the north side of the tabernacle, that's the table of showbread, and put the lampstand opposite it on the south side. For the entrance to the tent, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely list twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer, right? Somebody giving their skill on that. Once again, gold hooks for this curtain, five posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold, and five bronze bases for them. So, a lot of word descriptions. Don't know if you are a person who's able to imagine as you're reading through descriptions like this, but uh, here are some helps for us. Here is a picture of the outside of the temple there. This is, of course, once things are done. You see some things in here that we haven't had described yet, but you see all those curtains around, and then you see the uh, leather for the main tent with the five posts there. 
Uh, and then the smoke, that's the uh, altar of sacrifice, which we'll be reading about. The only thing I kind of disagree with this uh, drawing is how close the regular Israelite tents are to the main tent. Uh, the tent was in the midst of the camp. The other 12 tribes were encamped around. God wanted to dwell in the midst of the people, as we saw yesterday, 25 verse 8. But it was about a quarter mile walk from the tents to the temple. That, I believe, was to give people time to think about their sins as they're leading their animal to come and be sacrificed. They can think about their sins and what it means and that this animal was going to take the sin for them. So, but a good description overall. And you actually see that part of the, the uh, curtain here is lying down because they would take it all down and move it whenever the cloud would move and then they'd set it back up again. So that was significant work for the Levites. Uh, this is, if you peel back the outer cover, this is how things are arranged. So you see the Ark of the Covenant behind a curtain there in the smaller chamber of the most holy place. Uh, and then the table of showbread and the lampstand. There are still some articles and some things we haven't seen described yet, but those descriptions will be coming up. And by the way, this is stuff that the average Israelite would never see. The main priests would see the holy place on a daily basis, but only the high priest, only on one very special day we'll read about in Leviticus 16, would go into the most holy place. Here's one last picture I want to share with you, and I mostly wanted to share this with you because of the direction of the shadows. This is an afternoon view. You can see that the colors are very warm, like in the late afternoon. This would be about the time of the evening sacrifice, and notice the direction of the shadows. The sun is setting in the west. Shadows are being cast to the east. That shows that the temple was oriented to the west. This temple also shows that cloud, the pillar of cloud that was the... Uh, the significance of the presence of God, that continued. Uh, shade by day and warmth, fire by night. So they always knew that God was present in the camp. So some interesting setup here, maybe more detail than we need. You know, we don't, we're not in charge of setting this up and seeing it, but for the people of the day, they knew specifically what God wanted. No lack of detail in God's instructions there. Moving on to our second Old Testament passage now, Proverbs chapter 2. It is still appealing to wisdom, and it again uh, starts with the verse like a young person receiving this, and will they accept it or will they not? So appeals. In fact, I see in the first four verses three if statements. If you accept my words and store up my commands, turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. If you call out for insight, cry aloud for understanding. If you look for it as for silver, like treasure, search for it as hidden treasure. So, uh, yeah, so three ifs, and then we get the then in verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of Yahweh, find the knowledge of God. For Yahweh gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. He guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Don't you want safety, security, protection, prosperity? Then go to wisdom. Appeals for wisdom. Verse 11, discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. So be wise and you will, uh, you'll have a safer life, a happier life, a more prosperous life. And it's true, wise people tend to avoid dangerous situations and getting into, you know, deals that are nefarious or characters that are uh, shady, things like that. The protection language goes on for several verses here. Um, it also talks about protecting from uh, temptation. Verse 16, wisdom will also save you from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman and her seductive words. And then several words, uh, several verses kind of elaborating on that. Uh, verse 18, surely her house leads down to death and her paths lead to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. So they say prostitution is the oldest uh, profession in the world, still around today, but the Bible's warning is clear. Do not go down that path. You will not find life there. Some beautiful uh, verses in 20 and 21, thus you will walk in the ways of the good Keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But, here's the warning, verse 22, the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be torn from it. So, some bad verbs there, cut off and torn. Illustrations of what 
happens in the long run to wise versus foolish or wicked people. And um, certainly the, the strong urge there is to let the good verbs and the good adjectives describe you, dear son, rather than these negative ones in the latter half. So I pray that we take that Bible's advice. Uh, I think the fact that we're on this journey together through the Bible means that we are appealing to God for wisdom. I think we include some language like that in every prayer that we begin with. Moving on now to the New Testament, the gospel that I love so much, Gospel of John. We're learning insights, new, different things than Matthew, Mark, or Luke taught us here. Um, let's see, this starts out with a scene at a pool um, verse 2 says, There is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, this is in Jerusalem, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. This one is interesting here because it's an odd number of colonnades, and for a long time, historians and archaeologists were very skeptical about this because uh, designs from, you know, Roman places like that, they always had even numbers. You know, there would be fours and sixes and eights and twelves, but five, they'd never found a pool with five colonnades like that. But then, after excavating, I don't know how many years ago this was, I just remember seeing it in a video, I think a video I used to show my Bible students. Lo and behold, they dug down and they found this oddly shaped pool, and behold, it had five colonnades. So, uh, again and again, uh, archaeology affirms the Bible. Of course, there are lots of gaps, lots of things that haven't been found yet or may never be found, but there has never been a single archaeological find that has directly contradicted the scripture. So, let's see, at this pool called Bethesda, a great number of disabled people used to lie, blind, lame, paralyzed, and one had been there for 38 years. Now, through the story, we're going to get a glimpse of what people understood happened. Um, so here's this invalid for 38 years, perhaps he was born that way, or perhaps he was a young man and had an accident, and he was an older man now, but when Jesus saw him lying there, learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Seems like a silly question, right? Of course I want to get well! Anybody who's lame wants to get well, but this man, he is so driven in his pessimism, like he is just so firm in it, he's been in it for years, decades. He can't even bring himself to say, of course I want to be helped. He only comes out with the pessimist's answer. Verse 7. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And so they had this belief that when the water was stirred, it was like an angel was stirring up the water and the first person in was going to get healed. And I remember reading an article on this when I was in seminary. I always just read through this and, okay, I guess that's what God was doing. But it talks about the contrast of this cruel lottery system of healings versus the Son of God coming in and offering a healing just on the spot. I mean, he approaches the man and he, you know, he starts the conversation with the man. And so I'm not sure what to make of this. Um, we, uh, we do know that there is such thing as a placebo effect, so maybe some people who were mildly impaired said they felt better, and, you know, and that's how the legend grew. It's hard for me to imagine God using a system like this. You know, if God is benevolent, why not heal all? And why do this? It's like a cruel joke, right, to get all these, you know, lame and blind people, like, crawling toward the thing, and, I don't know, every several days the angel, well, I'll have, you know, time for another lottery, I'll stir the water. So I love the contrast, though. Instead of a cruel system of chance and luck and people who have more friends or people who have less ailment, here comes Jesus into the scene for a man who's, you know, he has nothing to deserve this, but just grace comes into the picture here. So he's complaining that he can never get into the water first. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Now, more must have happened than this, right? Some joy, some hollering, some jumping up and down, we don't know. But here comes the big uh-oh, latter part of verse 9. The day that Jesus did this was on a Sabbath. Oh, why did Jesus have to do it on Sabbath? Couldn't he have waited a day or two? We did see several interactions with Pharisees in the Synoptic Gospels about controversy of healing on the Sabbath. Well, here it is, this theme in this book as well. So the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, Hey, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. 
But the man replied, the one who cured me, who made me well, said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Seems to be okay with Jesus to just, you know, walk with a roll under your arm, right? So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? But the man had no idea who it was. Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. I don't know. <laughs> These guys are so frustrated. Later, uh, verse 14, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. And now here's the part that we might not want to be in here, but this is important. Jesus wouldn't give this warning unless it was important. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. There is something worse than being lame for 38 years, isn't it, friends? It's being lost. So Jesus wants to encourage him toward righteousness so that the worst thing than what he already had doesn't happen to him. Let's take that warning ourselves, right? Yes, we have temptations, but the Bible tells us very plainly that we cannot be trapped into sin. Uh, we will always have a way out of it. Verse 15, the man went away, told the Jewish leaders it was Jesus who had made him well. Why did he do that? I don't know. So, verse 16, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. And we don't know exactly what they said. They may have surrounded him. They may have, you know, uh, confronted him. But, verse 17, in defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work, and to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him, not only for breaking the Sabbath, but because he was calling God his own father, therefore making himself equal to God. So he's, he's gotten them even more mad just by saying that, right? God the Father is always working, my Father, and I have to do what I see him doing. Uh, so beyond the Sabbath problem, it's, ah, oh, he called God. Now, all Israel used to call God Father. I believe that was a term that was well known. But when the way Jesus said it, my Father, uh, and this shows, you know, in a genealogical, generational thing, uh, when you carried your Father's name around, you know, if I'm Mark, son of Roger, I am carrying around his reputation. If Roger is a man who has a good reputation, he's known for being fair and just and upright and paying back his debts, and I say, I'm Mark, son of Roger, I'm putting myself on the same footing. That's what Jesus was doing with God the Father, and it got the people very upset with him. So Jesus gave them this answer, verse 19. I very truly, I tell you, this is the aletheia aletheia. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. So I'm only mimicking what God the Father does and has given me to do. Verse 21, he starts talking about life and death here. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Ooh, we're starting to tread on the resurrection uh, talk now. Uh, now we start talking about judgment. Verse 22, moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. This is interesting because we always picture ourselves standing before God the Father, and maybe Jesus is our advocate, Jesus is our lawyer, Jesus has an arm around our shoulder. But this kind of messes with our concept of the judgment, because there are other places that talk about like being before the Father. Um, so I'm, not, I'm honestly not exactly sure how to jive this verse with some other verses that seem to say that, uh, you know, for, for example, 1 John, that same passage I quoted before, 2, 1 and 2, if we do sin, we have an advocate before the Father, right? Somebody who defends us to the Father. Sounds like the Father is in the place of judgment. But in this one, the Father has entrusted, you know, and that's very sweet because Jesus is the only one who knows what it is experientially to be tempted, to be weak like we are. The Father may know all factual things, but he's never known what it is to be on this side of the sinful equation. So, interesting. So, that's one of those little things that's in tension with other verses. I don't know of another verse that overtly says it like this, like Jesus did here. So I do affirm this verse. You know, I'm never going to cross out a, a verse of the Gospels because of three or, other, three or four other verses somewhere else. Uh, I'm going to affirm them both even as I understand, even as I admit that I can't understand it fully. Um, verse 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. That's a verse that's very easy for us to skip over in our eye, in our minds. Yeah, that verse doesn't mean much. But remember, the honor and shame society, right? If you bring honor to the Son, you are honoring the Father, and the Son is going to be receiving honor just as the Father does. So, verse 24, and this is uh, beautiful stuff here. This is the kind of stuff we use at funerals. 
Very truly I tell you, Aletheia, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Notice the past, or I guess present participle here. He has crossed over from death to life. We talked about in the book overview that in John, eternal life in heaven is not something that's far off in the distant future. It can be had now. And so Jesus talks about this. We are going to see with Lazarus that he says the phrase, even though they die, they shall live. But that life starts now. Eternal life starts now. We might have a brief interruption, a brief blip, but uh, for us, it'll only seem like an instant, right? Soul sleep. It's like when you put your head on the pillow, wake up in the morning. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in him, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So we talk about, you know, we're all alive, but we all have life derived. We get it from our parents. They get it ultimately from God who gives it. But Jesus seems to say that the Father has let him have life original, you know, along with the Father. So this is kind of some of that Trinitarian stuff, you know, how different versus similar is Jesus to the Father. Uh, he's talking about, he has life original, but it is because the Father granted it, so it is subordinate somehow. You know, these things are intention. Uh, authority to judge again, verse 27. Oh, now this is interesting because verse 25 said, The time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice and rise. So it sounds like he's talking about future and present. And then he says it again in 28, but he only says future. Why? Why does he say future twice and present once? I'm thinking my best understanding is because there were just a few miracles of resurrections during Jesus's ministry. Uh, the widow's son at Nain, the little girl, Jairus' daughter, and here in the Gospel of John, um, uh, Lazarus. So that's my best guess on it there. And there are people who resurrected at his death. That's right. Matthew talks about the grave's opening. So, but boy, picture this, friends. Let your imagination soar with this. Do not be amazed at this, verse 28, for the time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Oh, you mean there isn't just one resurrection for the righteous? There's actually a resurrection of condemnation, or to use a KJV word, damnation as well? So I'm finding here that every chapter we're having a couple of references to like perdition and being lost. Because we didn't have any in chapter 4, but we did have two in chapter 3, and we have two now in chapter 5 about uh, being lost there. Uh, we get, there, is, there are two other places that talk about two resurrections. One is Daniel 12, right toward the beginning, like verse 2, I think. And then the other one is Revelation 20. And in that one, we get the insight that those two resurrections are actually a thousand years apart from each other. God's point of view, even a thousand years, is as a day, to use a verse from Peter. And so Jesus just talks about them as if they're mashed there together. But uh, two resurrections is a biblical truth that's taught in a few places. Even many Christians probably aren't familiar with that concept. So, let's see. By myself I can do nothing, verse 30. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I do not seek to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself, verse 31, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony is about me is true. So we saw this principle yesterday in uh, the last chapter of 2 Corinthians. Uh, this is part of Hebrew law, and I'm sure we'll find this further on in the Pentateuch. But everything that is to be established in a court of law needs to be defended by two or three witnesses. So if Jesus came just himself, uh, that wouldn't, you know live up to the standard of the law. But uh, here are the other two witnesses. Verse 33, you have sent to John and he has testified of the truth. So John is one of the other witnesses. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it so that you may be saved. Jesus is like, I don't need, you know, a mere human to defend me, but for your standard of judgment, here you go. John was a lamp, verse 35, that burned and gave light and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. Let's see, we don't have the death of John the Baptist in the Gospel of John, but this is a little hint, right? You've got his light, you've chosen to have it for a while. Uh, I have testimony weightier than that of John, verse 36. The works the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, 
they testify that the Father has sent me. So John the Baptist testifies and the miracles testify. You want your two witnesses? There they are. Uh, let's see. And uh, additionally, verse 37, the Father who sent me himself testified. We know this is true at the baptism of Jesus that he testified out loud. And also further on in John, we're going to hear again an affirm affirmation of uh, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And he responds from heaven, I have glorified it and I will do so again. So let's see. You have never heard his voice or seen his form. And verse 38, nor does his word dwell in you for you do not believe in the one he sent. And then here is a great memory verse. I often gave this memory verse, usually to my juniors when we were studying the importance of the Bible. Jesus says here, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. So Jesus doesn't negate the scriptures, but he says to these Pharisees, you are studying the scriptures at the exclusion of believing in me, but they testify of me. And then verse 40, yet you refuse to come to me to have eternal life. So Jesus affirms that the Old Testament is true in that it testifies of him. And so just a few more verses here. I do not accept glory from humans, he says. Verse 42, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. Strong words, Jesus. Uh, and this is so fascinating. Jesus, you know, we often think of him as like meek and mild and absolutely it is one of his teachings to turn the other cheek. But Jesus, many times, we'll see this in John, he starts the debates, you know. Um, so there was, you know, a little bit of pushback about uh, some of the stuff he was doing. But then Jesus goes into a, you know, a big monologue about, about all this stuff. And to say that, I mean, there, he's not mincing words at all. You do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in their own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes only from God? You know, in our human nature, we chase after fame, do we not? Fame and renown. And the Pharisees were kind of the same way. If uh, somebody came and they were getting famous and men were giving them praise, they would follow along. But Jesus just operates on another level. I don't seek praise from men. I seek to please God and get my honor from God. And these people are against it. Last three verses here. Do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. So don't think I'm telling on you, <laughs> Moses, these words that you study and that you affirm and you sit in his seat, that is going to be your condemnation because you're not even living up to that which you affirm and claim. Verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Now this is interesting because while there are numerous messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, I don't think of a lot of them as coming from Moses. I guess you could say that the one at the end of Genesis when Jacob is blessing his sons was technically written by Moses. It was said by Jacob, but I guess Moses wrote it. And there are just a couple of others. We'll see those as we go through there. Jesus, uh, Moses did say that God will raise up another prophet like me from among you. But Jesus is, you know, so much more than a prophet in the way that Moses was. It's more the minor prophets toward the end of the Old Testament that have the really strong, specific messianic prophecies. You know, born of a virgin and Bethlehem and, you know, all these things. Uh, King David, you know, there are several prophecies in Psalms. I don't think of Moses as one of the major ones, but Moses was the one that these guys said they were following. So I'm not surprised Jesus says that, you know, he will be your accuser and he wrote about me. So... So, I, but that makes me affirm the couple of uh, prophecies that, you know, kind of two-thirds look like they could be about Jesus. I affirm, yes, they are, because Jesus here says, Moses wrote about me. So, verse, last verse here, 47. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So Jesus is almost like, what are you doing? You came to, you know, be all about Moses and his writings, but you're not even living up to that. <laughs> if you did, you would accept me, he says. All right, let's move to our last chapter here, Galatians 1, a new book of the Bible. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to go and look at the book overview for Galatians. Uh, Galatia was not a single city, but it was a region, and we'll find that here in verses 1 and 2. So it starts again. Uh, we talked about this before. Name and title, right? Paul, an apostle. And he's very quick to defend his godly calling here. This seems to be... Uh, a sore spot for him because it's true. His origin as an apostle was not like the others, right? 
an apostle sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. We have said before that uh, Paul is the most autobiographical and the whole second half of the chapter is going to be autobiography stuff for Paul. But it's fascinating and we get some unique stuff in this chapter. Uh, so, from Paul an apostle and from all the brothers and sisters with me, Adelphoi, to the churches in Galatia. So this is for several churches in a similar region. We might say like modern day, to the churches in southeastern California or something like that. Or in Orange County, something like that. So here comes a blessing, verse 3. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's beautiful to have that, especially as we're going to see there's problems in the church. But he starts out with a desire for peace, benefit, blessing. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. There's a brief summary of what Jesus did, right? He gave himself for our sins and to rescue us from this pleasant evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, all of a sudden, bang, pretty negative. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Uh, I want to take a moment here to remind you of the actual definition of the word gospel. It means good news. The actual word in Greek is the prefix that means good in Greek, you, and then message, which is angel, from the same word we get angels, messenger or message, the good message. And he says this thing that you're clinging to is not good news at all. It's not a good message. Uh, evidently, some of you, some people are throwing you into confusion, trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Paul is so certain, so sure about it. He says, if you hear anything else, even from a supernatural source, reject it. I will say it again, right? Emphatic. You didn't read me wrong. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Who am I trying to win the approval of? Human beings or God? There's a rhetorical question, right? Why would I want human approval when I obviously know there's so much more to live for and I'm looking for God's approval? Um, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, the whole rest of the chapter here is autobiography, and it's so fascinating. Uh, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any person, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by a revelation of Jesus Christ. Special uh, messages revealed to him, Paul says. He is truly a prophet in the literal sense, right? This knowledge has been imparted to him supernaturally. For you've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God, tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many people my own age. I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. He's kind of giving his Jewish credentials here. It's something he has turned away from. Boy, that son is really causing a problem, isn't it? <laughs> uh, let me change one thing. I'll be right back. All right, hopefully that's a little better. I was trying to even out the brightness, and I used a mirror over here. And <laughs> the sun came right under my face. So, I was so zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He, he's showing off his Jewish credentials. But, verse 15, when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. He wanted to, maybe not at the time, but now he wants to make sure that people don't think his apostolic authority is derived from the other apostles. He is claiming both in verse 1 and down here in verse 17, full apostleship from God. So he went into Arabia. What's Arabia? We have the country of Saudi Arabia now. I think Arabia kind of means the desert of the Middle East there. And this is the only place where we know about this, about Paul going to uh, Arabia. This isn't in the, uh, the book of Acts. Um, let's see, I'm trying to remember if Peter going to Cornelius' house is after the conversion. Maybe that happened while Paul was away. Uh, then, after three years, so between verses 17 and 18, we know that he went into the desert, kind of maybe live a monastic life, get taught directly by God for three years. This is the only place in Scripture that we get this from. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem, got acquainted with Cephas, that's one of the alternate names for Peter, and stayed with him 
a couple of weeks, 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. And that may be the only place also that we get the, the you know, the direct uh, link, family link between James and Jesus. This is not James, son of Zebedee, but the other James. So um, I may do a little research and, you know, put a bar here about what exactly is going on there. I assure you before God that what I am writing is no lie. God is my witness, right? And may God judge me if I'm, uh, if I'm telling a falsehood here. To use a more callous term in a worldly term, you know, I swear to God, right? Um, I'm testifying this to you before God. Uh, verse 21, then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea, that southern Israel who were in Christ. Never went to them. But they only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. So we get uh, an interesting introduction here. He's, he's uh, sounding quite defensive. But I praise the Lord that, that that need to defend his apostolic call makes him tell a whole biography and an order of how things happen. We get a great insight into Paul's own conversion and how he sensed his calling. So... Interesting also that he uses the term set apart from birth, like God knew what he was doing and um, maybe even used that big U-turn of zealous for Judaism versus zealous for Christianity apart from the trappings of Judaism as a testimony. So we're going to be spending about a week on this, a little less than a week on this book, and we're going to get some very good insights here. I'm looking forward particularly to some stuff in chapter 3. So. All right, that brings us to the end of our four chapters for today. Hope it has been enlightening and edifying for you. Uh, we're going to close up with a prayer here. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the wonderful insights. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we knew so much detail about your dwelling place in heaven and therefore how it should be done on earth. Thank you for the appeals to wisdom. I felt myself called to greater understanding, Lord, and greater teachability in my spirit. Please, Lord, make our hearts a place where you can deposit your wisdom and to be a fruitful uh, plot of land for you, dear Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for doing your miracles, for standing up against the criticisms of the Pharisees and teaching wonderful insights about resurrection and judgment throughout, dear Lord Jesus. And thank you for the testimony of Paul. Uh, you, Holy Spirit, inspired him and called him in that special way. And I pray that we would each also have a calling in you. Probably not as striking as Paul's. You had a very unique purpose for him, but no less, we are no less dear to you, no less visible to you, and no less important the people that we interact with. So please grant us discernment to sense who is uh, having a heart that is softening to your principles, Lord, and how we can tactfully, wisely give an encouraging word toward affirming you and loving you. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that we can be on this journey together. I pray that people would not hesitate to be in touch, whether it be in the comment section of the video or by a text or an email, Lord. We want to have the conversation going as a community. Please bless us throughout uh, the work week uh, until we can gather again on your holy Sabbath. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, goodbye, brothers and sisters. So happy to be with you today. Please greet your families from the Tatums. And of course, the leadership at the Orange and Anaheim SDA churches wish you a wonderful week in the name of our Lord Jesus. God bless you all. Bye-bye.